I started interviewing elderly Sindhis in 2011 and um, actually started with my own mother and I'll tell you a little later why and how that happened. But uh, what I learned from her was so interesting that I realized this is an, it's a big story. It's never been done before, so let me do it. And I went ahead and interviewed other people. And then I got into this. It became so important to me that I've continued doing it. I've continued. Uh, I, I'm looking all the time for elderly Sindhis to hear their stories. And um, I have published quite a lot. Some of the things that I'm going to tell you about today are the insights I've had into what actually characterized the Sindhi story. Second, how I collect and present my data, my method, and uh, what I actually want to achieve by sharing these stories. And thirdly, why I started doing this. I think I already told you that to an extent. And uh, my impetus for continuing. Uh, so this is an early map which shows the distribution of Hindus and Muslims across the subcontinent. This was, I think, to do with the 1935 Government of India Act. And uh, you can see that, uh, you know, the green parts are where there's a Muslim majority, the orange parts are where there's a Hindu majority, and the parts that are not colored uh, within the map are, are uh, largely the princely states. Here you can see the lines that uh, cut the Indian subcontinent into three different parts. And um, as you can see, Punjab and Bengal were divided with one part going to each of the countries that were formed at the time, whereas Sindh was given intact to Pakistan. So when the Hindus left and the fact that they could never return to their homeland, means that they never again had access to a place where Sindhi was spoken on the streets and where their culture was playing out and evolving in a natural way. And that's one of the main things that characterize the Sindhi story. Another interesting thing about the Sindhis is the way they behaved at the time of partition. Uh, it, they actually moved as one people. This is interesting because the Hindus of Sindh actually are a fairly heterogeneous lot. But not only that, the, what they did, the way they behaved is extraordinary because they moved. And I'm not talking about just one family or one group of families. A large majority of this community of Hindu Sindhis that were leaving their ancestral homeland forever, they just left. Uh, most of them couldn't take anything, any material possessions with them. And they landed up in different places which were unfamiliar to them. And, um, you know, they kind of helped each other. The, there were quite a few wealthy ones within the community who went out of their way to make their relatives and others of the community comfortable and rehabilitate them. And they kept moving. I mean, you know, they just landed up and they said, fine, okay, this is what we have now. What do we do next? And they focused so much on the future. They were looking at how to establish themselves again. And they were doing things like looking around them and seeing needs that needed to be fulfilled. And they, were, they started, they did this. And I think, you know, the way that they behaved, the way that they moved ahead and established themselves soon enough, it's really a remarkable thing, which has never been given the appreciation, um, the admiration that it should have. So when I say that the Hindus were, Hindus of Sindh were heterogeneous, Partly it's due to uh, regional differences where from place to place there were my sm small cultural differences and this would be from one town to another and also obviously there would be a, a difference between the rural uh, population and the urban population and uh, the Hindus were largely an urban people. But apart from that, uh, I should also say that a lot of the Hindus had, uh, you know, Sindh was largely a Muslim, uh, Muslim majority place, as we've seen. And a lot of the Hindus had migrated back into Sindh over a period of around 200 or 150 years from the neighboring provinces. And they came uh, looking for, uh, um, you know, sustenance. And there were a few opportunities around which they clustered. And these formed uh, sub smaller communities uh, with their own subculture.
In fact, as you'll see from this map, the Hindus of Sindh were actually spread out all around the world. They had ports, um, they had shops in the ports in many different countries. And this was long before partition. Uh, it's quite a long story, so I'm not going to get into it now. But if you want, you can read about it in the work of Claude Markowitz, who actually came up, stumbled across this and another Sindhi network, which um, you can look at if you want to. So when I started interviewing people, sometimes I would hear them um, sharing similar experiences. Uh, for example, my mom told me that uh, when I close my eyes, I can still see those places. And I was very moved by that, but I also heard others say the same thing, which was interesting. The other thing she said was, we used to, when we went to school in winter, we would uh, carry, up, our pockets would be filled with dry fruit. And there were others also who said the same thing. So, you know, this vision of Sindhi children going to school in winter with their pockets full of dry fruit is obviously something that happened quite a lot. But then I, when I had people saying to me that my grandfather built the Sakhar Barrage, or uh, my father was the chief engineer on the Sakhar Barrage, and that I wasn't very sure whether um, uh, you know this was true, because how many engineers can you have on the Sakhar Barrage? And that's the way I did think until I realized that actually the Sakhar Barrage is, just, is not just one little bridge over the river. It, it was this enormous uh, engineering project and there were canals across a very large area. And obviously they did use a lot of engineers. And then I also learned this very interesting thing. Now, I did know that Sindhis are very, very, for them, education is extremely important because I saw that in my own family. Uh, my grandfather, you know, he, he just would read and read and until he was really old and he could hardly see, he would be using a uh, magnifying glass under a bright light and reading uh, new stuff on medicine, on philosophy, and he would, you know, take a, a bus to the British Council Library uh, where on um, Saturday first thing in the morning he'd be there when the library opened when they had their new lot of books out. And of course... It wasn't just him. Everybody was doing it. Education was extremely important in Sindh. And I knew that from many of the stories I'd learned. And what I, about the engineers, I did know that they had a, a very well-known educator, S.C. Shahani, who was the principal of the DJ Sindh College. So there were a lot of uh, schools and colleges in Sindh. They started women's education in 1885. And, I mean, there were schools for girls as early as that. And then uh, the college came up. And uh, S.C. Shahani, when they started talking about... The college came up, I think it was around 1887. And when they started talking about the um, barrage uh, in around 1910 or 19, between 1910 and 1920, he knew that this was a big opportunity. They need engineers. And he actually started an engineering college as well. So this was uh, one of the things that I learned. And then I was also surprised by the number of people who'd say, oh, you know what, my grandfather was the mayor of Karachi. And that I really was doubtful about because um, you have all this stuff online. I mean, there, there are records which tell you uh, who was the mayor and when. And what I did see online was that the uh, first uh, elected mayor was in 1933. And he was a Parsi gentleman, very well known and very much loved gentleman who was the mayor. But there were some people who stuck their ground and they said, no, my grandfather was there. I mean, I, there's this one family who said this to me and they're very sure about it. And this would have been in the 1920s. And eventually, after a lot of doubting, I realized that uh, the Karachi Municipal Corporation was much older than 1933. And yeah, they did have an elected head and um, might not have been actually called the mayor. But, you know, the terminology may or may have come in later, so there was no reason for me to, um, to doubt what they were saying. In the process of looking for records, I also learned that quite a few of the old records have been destroyed. And uh, I haven't checked every source, obviously, but I did find even some documents where there was a trail of a name and it was absolutely Im impossible to locate. So uh, that is one of the problems that we face. Even though it wasn't that long ago, because of the history that we have, many documents were destroyed. 
So now I've told you a little about how I was dealing with my own preconceptions. And then now I want to tell you about some of the things that I heard which made me uncomfortable. For example, people would tell me, many people, almost everyone would tell me things like when we came to India or when we came from Pakistan. And this I found a little disturbing because they're saying that they came to India as if they were coming from a foreign country. And they really weren't. They were, it was always, I mean, they always lived in India. They were Indians. It was very much an integral part of India. And uh, they couldn't, I mean, you know, even when you say you're coming from Pakistan, technically that's true because they left after Pakistan was formed. But the extent of association, I mean, there's, from the way I look at it, they had to leave because Pakistan was formed. I've actually heard um, this very prominent businessman once on the History Channel saying that uh, my family has its roots in Pakistan. And I was so shocked at this kind of, um, this the feeling that your family has its roots in Pakistan. How is that possible? Pakistan was formed in 1947. Your family's roots go back a long way before that. There was no such thing as Pakistan at that time. So I find this... Uh, I don't understand why why people cling to this. I have a problem with it. Even after I explain to them and they agree with me, I find that they're still saying it. The other thing that I used to hear elderly Sindhis saying a lot is, we ran away. We ran away from our homeland. Uh, we ran away to safety. So they were obviously feeling a little bit diffident about the fact that they left without fighting. And uh, you have to go back to the values of the time where, you know, you had to um, chop off people's heads and make your women jump into a well and so on, because that was the manly thing to do. But Sindhis are different. And for them, it's not about cowardice. It's about a respect for life. And that's something I learned when I started understanding the spiritual values of the time, which I'm going to tell you in a little while. Another thing that I've heard a lot of elderly Sindhis saying is this claim that, oh, we were not refugees. And that I couldn't really understand until one of my own uncles told me we were never refugees. And that's when I realized what he was trying to say is that although they had to leave home without anything, they were able to start new lives again uh, without compromising their um dignity without compromising without being wretched and um, so you know that that may be true but then again when you look at it from today's context yes they certainly were refugees in fact they were role model refugees who um, you know moved took the right steps they made the right decisions they, they, they worked in a certain way without um, looking for assistance and handouts and this is something that actually happened to me when I was writing something for uh, an Indian news portal. Uh, and this was in, um, I think, two or three years ago when we were celebrating this big uh, milestone after independence. And partition was actually being talked about for the first time. Before that, before this, people were not even willing to acknowledge partition because, you know, partition only meant trains full of dead bodies and the most awful ghastly things but here people um, now people had by by this time like three years ago people had actually started thinking about partition and uh, the many different kinds of stories that it carried so I was asked to write something and I did and one of the stories that I wrote was about how National College in Bombay was built and it was built by this um, gentleman, the founder, who was a professor at National College in Hyderabad, Sindh, and how he left and how he came to Bombay as a, quote, refugee, unquote, and he was living in a house full of uh, others, and I interviewed someone who was a child at the time who told me that this person, Professor Kundanani, he would leave the house every morning and Nobody knew where exactly he was going, but everybody knew that he was determined to start National College again. And on Sundays, he would sit down with a stack of postcards and he would be writing postcards to his former colleagues in Sindh. 
and they were scattered all over the country you know whether it was ajmer or bhopal or coimbatore or wherever and he was writing to them saying that i understand we are all going through a diff- difficult time and whatever you're doing now whether you're frying tikkis or helping your uncle in your shop or your um in his shop or you're giving tuitions or whatever you're doing to sustain yourself and your family do it but do it with the confidence that i'm building national college and i'm going to call you back very soon so be patient so in the process of um, writing this article i had got an edited version back in which this line had been inserted education was one of the sectors that many sindhis got into and i it upset me because it seemed like you know they were using the wrong context uh, there was a bit of sindhi phobia in it in the sense that they did not understand that sindhis were looking at education because education was important to them it it made, it made it look as if sindhis were looking at at education as an opportunity as a sector and the truth is that they were trying to fill the gap there were so many young sindhi people uh, children and you know young adults whose education had got interrupted and of course so many teachers and people who are education professionals whose careers had been disrupted this is something someone um, i met for the first time uh, in around 2011 when i was writing my first book and someone introduced us and said that she's writing a book about sindhis and she said to me oh you know and she really believed this that all the prime real estate all over the country belongs to the sindhis they got huge acres of land from the government all of sind society nouns the government gave it to them and uh, it was this um, very strong conviction that sindhis are the, this crafty people who somehow have cheated the rest of india so here we have the stereotype of uh, people who are obsessed with money they are shrewd and um, unscrupulous and alongside they're also pretty tasteless and overweight and loud mouthed and you know all these things which if you look around you isn't actually true i mean when i look at it i i grew up with these stereotypes and i never actually wanted to associate myself with uh, being a sindhi which as it happens i'm not uh, my mom was a sindhi and her parents were na i mean they were not like this at all i mean they were both slim and trim and they spoke very softly and they never expected anything from anyone even when they gave them something so i don't know how these stereotype types uh, form themselves and partly in the case of sindhis it's because they came without anything and they came to places and in those days the economy of india was very different from what it is today there was hardship there was shortage and when they came and they settled within the populations that were facing this situation and they began to do well there was some amount of resistance particularly from the business community who felt that by trading at lower margins they were being cheated so that and then after that after these um you know uh these kind of ideas became established bollywood didn't help with all kinds of ghastly characters who spoke in a strange accent and who wore pointy white shoes and you know were always trying to cheat people one of the things i found was that even when people were talking about sindhis without uh denigrating them they were restricting their impressions to just a few characteristics for example they were seen with admiration as very hard working they were seen as very enterprising and while i do agree with this um like this story for example about the a sack full of grain where the refugee comes and he goes to the wholesale market and he buys a sack of grain and he sits down in the in the retail section of the of the town and he sells all the grain at a much lower price than what it's available in the shops and after he's done that he sells the sack as well this is like one of the classic stories of a uh, house in these uh, rehabilitate themselves but this ingenuity and this hard work and this commitment is just a small part of the sindhi identity and there's a huge other part which was tragically lost one of the things i learned was the um tremendous contribution of sindhis to the freedom struggle 
And uh, it was a big thing in Sindh. There was a lot of respect for Gandhi. There were hundreds of people who were in jail during the freedom movement. Sindh had martyrs, young, a young boy by the name of Hemu Kalani was one of the stories that I learned, who, uh, you know, he was captured during the, 19, during the Quit India Movement 1942. And um, when people petitioned for his release, uh, they they were told that if he gives the names of his co-conspirators, he will be released, and he refused. So he was hanged, and this was Hemu Kalani who died when he was just 19 years old. And there are many other stories. Uh, even the women took part, women, uh, and not just that, but there were Sindhis in other parts of India also who were very committed to the prayer movement, who, who spent time in jail. And then, um, you know, when independence came, they found, very sadly, they'd lost their own land. There was another aspect of Sindhi culture which I came across, which I found really surprising because I'd always seen Sindhis as being kind of right-wing, and um, because of their partition experience, many of them uh, were a bit wary about Muslims. And what I found with great surprise was that in Sindh, there was so much of participation in each other's customs, a kind of syncretic nature of worship, where there were um, saints and um, beliefs of other religions were taken very seriously and respected a lot. And in fact, this syncretic culture even continues till today. Many Sindhi temples around the world have, um, they revere religious figures and religious beliefs of other religions and they participate in religious rituals in other countries where they are as well as they introduce their own and for example I've seen this Ganpati procession which is actually not even native to Sindh the people who settled in other parts of you know maybe in Maharashtra, Bombay, Pune and they got involved with Ganpati and they've taken it to Spain and Africa and various other places. The main reason, of course, why Sindhis have allowed their culture to dissipate is because they were so focused on integrating into their new communities and belonging to the places where they settled. So most of them speak the local language and, um, you know, people really can't tell that they've come from somewhere else and they have another they lost their homeland, they had another culture. And one of the funny offshoots of this is that though when they say Pakistan, it's very annoying, somehow in Bombay and Pune, we have this Karachi all over and we don't even notice that, um, you know, it's Karachi is this city of another country that India is supposed to be at war with. When you see Karachi, Sweet Mart, you just know that it's about... It's not about bombs, it's about um, samosas and pani puri and sweets. And of course, everybody knows this, Karachi Bakery is a South Indian special. So these two pictures I chose as symbols of the lost culture of the Hindu Sindhis. And the first is uh, an image which shows you the Sindhi alphabets. Uh, you can see they look quite attractive actually, there are 52. And um, looking at them, you can see that actually these are very easy. Anybody could learn them in a, in a few days. Uh, but unfortunately, Sindhi children have not been given this opportunity for many years, for decades. And as a result, the uh, treasures of Sindhi literature have been lost to the present generation. And the other picture shows Shah Abdul Latif, who was a philosopher, poet of Sindh, and um, his work is tremendous. It's uh, very deep and uh, 
um, it's it's it embodies a very vast and beautiful philosophy now most hindu sindhis of today don't know who he is they wouldn't recognize this picture and they have no idea about what he said i'm sure there are lots of elderly sindhis even today who do know and can still quote from him because they learnt it learnt what he wrote in school and um you know they would as a, uh, as they grew up they might even have quoted uh, from his work to each other but the the uh, significance of his philosophy which was so important to to sindhis and still is to the sindhis in sindh um is lost to the hindus uh and it's that philosophy and what it embodies that i think gave the hindus the strength to deal with what they did deal with during partition it's the core from which they respect life it's the core from which they did not attack uh the people who were attacking them and it's the core from which they looked after their women and um, you know sent them ahead to safety Uh, or traveled with them when they were leaving and made sure that they were safe but because of what happened during partition uh, this huge important body of thought uh, it may still have an influence on them but they're not aware of where it's coming from uh so i've done a lot of interviews and let me tell you a little bit about the process i follow First of all I don't have a set of list of list of questions and I prefer a free flowing conversation. So to set you know sometimes people are a little awkward when you start so I always start by asking and writing down the person's full name um uh, the year in which they were born and if possible the place and also the parents names. And I document family and clan history so this is a good place to start. but i found that it's also a good place for people to think about their origins and talk freely about their lives so then people start talking and they keep going sometimes um, there's a a break and they they you know they say that okay that's it i don't have anything more to say and if i want to get them back to talking about their lives sometimes i ask about the historical events of the time and that usually sets off another flood of memories or um, then i ask them about you know circumstantial detail for example what were the toilets like um or what were the what kind of uh, crockery did you um use and um, things like that so uh, i always record when i'm speaking i mean or rather when they're speaking and sometimes there's a little bit of effort to make them comfortable when they know they're being recorded but usually after a little while the pressure is off and they forget and they speak naturally now one of the problems of course with this is that sometimes they say things which they don't really want everyone to know and uh you just become um, a custodian of this very privileged knowledge which you just have to make sure that you know if they don't want it known then you don't make it known it's like private i found that by just sitting and listening with interest and in a non-judgmental way not interrupting their flow of thought people find it easy to speak and they enjoy the process a lot i do have to stay alert to pick up new things that they mention and that's not really easy especially after it's a um, you know it's usually quite a long uh, interview and um, that's when uh, you know my if my attention lapses that's when it's really useful to have recording to listen to and quite often i just catch those really special things only while listening later and then i have to go back and talk to them again um i find capturing context is a challenge <laughs> sometimes i have elderly people saying things like you know i was earning only 100 rupees in my first job and they find that very amusing but then you know i just ask them okay 100 rupees that sounds like quite a lot for your time because uh, how much did a house cost or how much did a bus ticket cost or what was the price of eggs or something like that and then they become more comfortable that you can understand um what things were really like in their time and that you don't find them peculiar uh so one of the things which i find is a big challenge is that people don't talk about things that they take for granted and they assume don't need to be said and very often these are the most important cornerstones of their stories so um you know you just have to keep probing and listening until they emerge 
uh, and sometimes um, you know you get the sudden insight when somebody says something like i i know this happened to me with my mom's story she would talk a lot i mean she had spoken a lot about kite flying which i thought was great and then the book was ready and just like everything was ready and then suddenly one day she says to me you know what we had no umbrellas in sindh and that really made me sit up because i knew this when they arrived in bombay it um and they didn't have umbrellas in sindh because uh, it hardly ever rained in sindh sindh is not a monsoon country and in fact if it wasn't for the river indus and uh, all the irrigation canals it be a desert large parts of it would be a desert so because they hardly had any rain and here they were the, these families who were um, you know flocking to bombay to get away from the violence and uh, what was happening in sindh and it was raining and it was raining and raining it wasn't just raining it was pouring and it that rain went on for days and days and here were these kids who had not seen an umbrella before you know how different was their life for them and eventually when they started going to school i mean they'd been used to writing from right to left reading and writing from right to left and now they had to start learning to read and write the proper way which is from left to right So when I'm presenting the stories my focus is to present a wide range of facts and personal anecdotes and theories which comes straight from the people I'm talking to they're not anything to do with me and I'm presenting what other people have told me without any leading or bias that's what I I I I want to do and um when i get contradictory opinions from different people i just make sure i put them together so that the reader gets a sense of or the reader gets a wider perspective and can develop their own opinions another thing which i want to do which is extremely important to me is to engage the reader in the stories they're reading and i my aim is to use literature to convey con- to convey what a person says So another thing I want to tell you about my work is that I self publish. And um when I started doing so there was a reason at uh, the first book I did I was in a big hurry to get it done and there just wasn't any time to look for a publisher. I I my mom had mentioned the date on which her ship arrived in Bombay and I decided now that's the date on which we're going to launch the book and you know call all her cousins and my uncles and everyone and give them copies. um but you know back then which is 2012 i might have hesitated i might have felt a little diffident about being somebody who self publishes but then now as everybody knows the publishing industry is completely different and as for me i find that publishing give, uh, on my own publishing my my books myself gives me a lot of independence in terms of timelines like i can get things done uh, when i want to it i also get a lot of um freedom in terms of how i want my, my books to look so i i can get the cover exactly the way i want without um having to discuss it with anyone except my designer who happens to be my daughter and i also make the pages myself and it means a lot to me to be able to choose the fonts and the layouts and the margins and uh, everything myself um so for this book that i was doing um which was released last year um I found that when I was working on the appendices it looked really boring so then I livened it up by adding images and jokes and so on as you can see. Uh so I also wanted to show you my mom. This is um Situ, my mother, and uh, this photo was taken in Jaipur in January 2011. Um I I we started working on the book a few months later and um uh, this we the reason we did this is because i mean i'm a writer and over the years i have kind of specialized in working with people to help them write their memoirs so that's what i do so in uh, mid 2011 i said to her you know what none of us in the family know anything about your childhood and since so why don't you tell me about it and let's uh, make something for our family so she very sportingly agreed and she came up with all kinds of things which i found fascinating and i knew that uh, i can't just stop at her story i interviewed a few other people i read a lot of books and for those um th- for those books i'm really grateful to nandita bhavnani who um you know she's a writer in sin studies and i consider her 
Uh, I'm really grateful to her for all the help she gave me when I started out.